Dude. And it looks like we're recording. So, episode 001, we got Kevin Love, the all great and powerful, and we're starting this off on the idea that there is no such thing as bad publicity. Um, so welcome, Kevin. I, uh, I want to introduce him as, in my opinion, someone who's always helped me with my business ventures. Uh, I've truly grateful for him. I mean, you know, he's taking time out of his busy day just to sit down with me, have this conversation and, you know, we'll get into it, but the man's, the man's got a mind on him for business. Like he's had successful exits of startup companies. He's always grinding, making new things happen. Um, I met him in San Diego and now we're both on different cities in the East coast having this, having this chat. Um, so without further ado, the great, the great Kevin Love. How are we doing? I love that plug there, bud. <laughs> the great Kevin Love. Um, I'm humbled by that. Uh, it's good to be on episode 000, I think is what you're uh, referring to this episode number as. Uh, no, no, you're episode one. My favorite number. You're episode yeah, one. Yeah, episode one. All right, dude. Yeah. Um, so we're, I don't know how PG we are, but I guess we're popping the cherry. Right? Dude, go so, for it. You can say anything you want, yeah. man. Shit, fuck, this, shit, this is, piss. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now that we've got that out of the way. Uncensored. Yeah, we're, we're, we're totally good to keep going. Um, no, man, it's great to be on. Uh, appreciate the intro. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we've known each other for a couple of years now. Uh, introduced in San Diego. Um, I moved out there from New York uh, as a co-founder of a cannabis startup. So it was a pretty exciting time uh, moving from finance over to uh, the West Coast to essentially be a uh, drug dealer, a legalized <laughs> drug dealer. So um, it, it all you know, has worked out pretty well. Um, we had our first exit for our uh, cannabis company. Uh, we we actually like shifted our business model around a little bit. So and what was that? Two roots, more right? Into, yeah. So two roots is more of like a CPG brand now. So we what's focus a, hold on, on real like, quick. What's a CPG brand? So it's uh, consumer packaged good. Okay. Um, so like a Red Bull or like a cubic toothpaste, like those gotcha. are like in the CPG category. Revive, which happens to be. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Revive, which is, yeah, a brand that I started a couple of years ago uh, independently. But yeah, man, um, it's been a crazy journey. Uh, and you kind of met me at like a pretty interesting shift in my life, uh, kind of going from like corporate America to more on like the entrepreneurial side of things, even though um, I was always an entrepreneur, not always in the legal sense uh, sure. growing up. So definitely have some pretty good stories there. And um, well, let's let's yeah, start man, there because it's, that's it's interesting. Been a wild ride. So yeah, let's start there because that's interesting because I guess, you know, my view of you has always been just this entrepreneurial type person you know, whether he's a CEO or starting up a company. Um, but that's and, really fascinating because, you know, you have, what's that? Say that one more time. Uh, I was saying that it's really fascinating because like in my mind, I've only known you as like a CEO entrepreneur type guy, but you're even saying that, I mean, obviously you had a life before you met me. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, let's, I guess we could dive into that. So you felt like cool. you were an entrepreneur whenever you were a kid, but did life take you into the finance route then? Yeah, yeah you know, um, I I think growing up, like uh, your community just has such a like profound influence on For you. Sure. So um, when you when you're from you know a community where uh, predominantly people here are attorneys and accountants and work in finance. Um, you know, it's it's naturally a influence that uh, is kind of um, impressed upon you from an, a, a pretty early age. Um, you know, in my particular household, uh, growing up, my my dad was uh, you know always working for like he was in the two way communications industry and uh, had worked for big companies like Motorola. I'm sure you're familiar with and another heard of uh, company called Bearcom. He was a partner in. Yeah, you've heard of him. <laughs> um, and when he was 50, he actually started his own business. So when he was 50, I was, you know, like an early teen, somewhere around there. Okay. Um, so I, I still had this like instillment of like following a natural trajectory in life. And, you know, I was always um, looking for, for bigger, better, stronger type opportunities. You know, when I was a young kid, I was mowing lawns in my neighborhood making like 
twenty dollars a cut Hell on the yeah. weekend. Uh, you know, I had like four or five uh, clients uh, that I service, so it, it was kind of like that. Like hard work was something that was always instilled in me. But um, you know, just like having these influences and kind of like being put on that track. Um, I was always focused on wanting to go into finance because uh, those opportunities, like, you know, my neighbor down the street, like got a brand new Ferrari every two years. And I would always ask my dad, what does that guy do? Yeah. I want to be that guy. Yeah. And uh, of course he worked in finance. So like whenever you saw someone with a boatload of money, it was like, they work in finance. Right? Right. Uh, they could have been a drug dealer for all we do. But right. That was the answer. Finance we got is, the cover, is the cover umbrella. <laughs> yeah. It's like the cover up. So, um, you know, with that, I, I was always influenced to do that. And, um, you know, I went to college, majored in finance. Uh, my dad uh, continued growing his business and actually sold it um, to a publicly traded company for like a huge payout um, in 2011. So I've been working uh, for JP Morgan for about a year and a half at that point. And, um, you know, seeing his success and how he kind of took this chance um, at a, you know, pretty late stage in his life uh, at 50. Um, not a lot of people look to reinvent themselves at that age. So, sure. um, you know, it was always inspiring, but it wasn't something that I like necessarily felt like prepared to step up to and like rise to that occasion. So, um, you know, I just kind of took the conservative route, uh, you know, stuck around in finance for, uh, God, like six, seven years. Um, Stay for options I always easier. It, it, it was, and you know, it, it was, it was more than a safe option for me. Um, okay. The company I was working for, uh, you know, I was around really smart people. Um, I, I would be the most like un undereducated person sitting at the table. I mean, the guy sitting next to me had the same job as me right. um, had just graduated from Yale School of Management, right? Um, the guy went to USC undergrad as a California resident. So uh, like you, you see these, these type of pedigrees in this environment and, um, you, you get to learn a lot, but what I kind of realized was, and where I stood out was I, I, I was never, you know, the smartest guy in the room, but I was always the most like practical guy, if that makes sense. So I think for, sure. for the first like seven to eight years, my professional career, just like seeing how really smart people think and then like adopting that to the way I go about doing business, uh, I guess is the best way to put it was um, something that I kind of felt like I was prepared to take that next step. And, uh, that's at the point where I decided to move to California, uh, got together with a you know, group of, I don't want to call them associates, but just people in my network who, um, had had previous successes in the business world and thought sure. alignment would be really strong for kind of my next path in life to kind of learn what they knew. And, um, that's what I moved out to Cali and did that for four years and maintained my equity ownership in the company. But, um, you know, at the end of 2019, early 2020, uh, I kind of decided that, you know, now's the time to break off and like truly do something um, independently. Uh, Cause I felt like, you know what, I have my primary background in finance, which is like a very sound foundation, um, you know, Right. migrating that into kind of more of this entrepreneurial type um, exposure that I had. And I just kind of married those two and decided to, again, break off and do my own thing independently. So, uh, yeah, it's I don't want to say the rest is history because, you know, the still future is it. still being written for yeah. me. But, yeah, man, it's it's been a pretty wild ride so far. Well, um, definitely sounds I, like I wouldn't recommend it for anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Not exciting, heart, right? That's for sure. Not for the faint yeah. of heart. Well, no, I mean, yeah. you know, I think it's really fascinating. It sounds like you've been surrounded by, you know, intelli intelligent at some metric, like whether, you know, your dad is business intelligence or you're around people who are book intelligence. And then you kind of, and I'm going to use this word to describe you because I've used it to describe myself as kind of chameleon off of them and say, okay, what are these people doing? You know, what can I learn from them? And what am I able to take from them and implement in my life that's going to put me on a path of success? Right. And and you, you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, part, I think one of the biggest, like, epiphanies that I've had in all this, um, 
your your environment, as we mentioned earlier in our conversation, it, it's super impactful, right? Um, if you spend a significant amount of time with one individual who's adversely different from you, like you'll start to pick up their characteristics. Right. right? Um, the the most challenging thing, especially like for someone early in their career, is going through the path of realizing like what's good and what's bad, right? And I think a lot of people use the term that you just use, like a chameleon to um, hide what their true colors are and what their true intent is. And you, you hear the story time and time again with young entrepreneurs or you know young business professionals that just kind of find themselves in this, um, almost in this pigeonholed environment where they, they can't, like see beyond what's in front of right. them because it's it's almost like this restrictive environment. So there there's two challenges to that. Like there's a time and place to step out and really roll the dice in life and take a chance and see what you're capable of accomplishing, right? Right. Um and and I think part of the challenge with like the modern narrative that we see on Instagram and Facebook and in our friend circle, it's like we're trained to believe we can do anything we want to do, even from an early age, but it's more like prolific, I guess is a good way to put it nowadays with like going on Instagram and seeing that douchebag that, you know, sat behind you in math class that slept the entire class that is now posting a photo, you know, uh, mean mugging people with his new Lamborghini. It's like, well, like I can't connect those dots. And I think it provides this false narrative and this false sense of like being able to accomplish something before you're really um, able to accomplish what you're looking to right. do. So if this, it's it's kind of this weird dichotomy that we're in where, um, yeah, it's like, A, are you ready? B, have you been surrounded by the right people that have been educating you um, based upon what you need to be educated on to accomplish what your bigger dreams are and uh, see, are you really aligned with what, what you're putting out in the world? And right. I, I think like looking at those three factors are, are just like super critical, but mostly overlooked, unfortunately. Well, let me see, let me see if I can connect the dots for you here. Cause you made an interesting point, right? Where you're attaching that kid who you knew in high school where he slept all the time and now he's in a Ferrari. And then you even kind of talked about, uh, and here's the way I'm seeing it is like, and you kind of mentioned this after the fact when you're like, oh, well, you know, you need to surround yourself with the right people. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I think the point that you're getting at is that it's about that in-between stage of, you know, that kid who was, you know, sleeping in class, sitting there doing nothing. I mean, granted, you have no idea what he's been doing for the last five, 10 years to find himself in a Ferrari. You just see Ferrari and it's like, holy right. shit, like. I mean, you have no idea, right? He could be from drugs. He could be renting it. Maybe he doesn't right, even right. own it. Maybe he bought it outright. Maybe he sold a sick startup company that he took. Maybe he started that company in, when he was in fifth grade, sleeping in class. He came to him a dream in, in that class and then, you know, right, went out right. and did it. Um, but it's like, I think that's a huge point that you bring up. The, and I think the that, inventor of, of the ultimate pillow, right? Yeah. It's like as he's sleeping, yeah. Oh, man, do you know it would be a great invention? Yeah. I got a great idea for a pillow. Yeah, yeah. right. I would do yeah. then you buy a Lamborghini. I mean, it's that same, <laughs> you know, mindset. Yeah. It's almost that like, you know, it's it comes into that instantaneous nature, right? Of when you see something on social media, you're like, I want that. And I think that's good. I think there's definitely some value there. It's just training ourselves that it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And maybe right. maybe that's something that you might be able to elaborate on with these startups. Um well, here, here's, I guess, here's what I'll ask you. Uh, elaborate maybe on the process of the time, let's say it takes, but also maybe you have to kind of begin with the end in mind. And I know I've heard in the um, startup world or in the entrepreneurial community about the idea of a successful exit. Now, I see that as such an ambiguous term, right? What's successful to you might not be successful to me, and what's successful to me might not be successful to you. So are you... Right. Maybe from your background and your entrepreneurial side of things, you know, maybe you could kind of, I hate to use the word elaborate, but connect the dots there between like the process, the effort that goes into it, and then what makes it a successful exit. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I'll, I'll kind of unpackage that piece by piece. I, I, I think the first and the most critical thing to realize um, are the things that we see as these unicorn type companies that, um, you know, are, are portrayed as overnight success. Amazon, um, Facebook, you know, that, Google. Yeah, but, but, but all that is bullshit, right? And, and what we know is what it is today, right? right. And if you watch any interview of, you know, Bezos or Musk or Gates or um, Jobs, I mean, you, you go down the list, like these are like key success stories in our generation, but um, all, all we filter in is what they have today, right? right. And, and we don't, we don't really look at what they had to go through to get to where they, they are today. And even on like little things like app creation, like the inventors of Instagram and Facebook, I mean, there's a whole movie on the challenges that Zuckerberg went through and the amount of people he had to, you know, ultimately fuck over in order to make his dream a reality. But we, we as a society, we, we filter kind of all the stuff we don't want to think about or hear about. And we focus on, you know, the things that are like, wow, like that's the American dream. Right. right. Um, so I, I think like the, the first part of the question is like, what, what are like the true expectations of a startup? Um, minimum seven to 10 year commitment. Um, that that's usually, and, and the best baseline wow. to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, private equity, uh, companies. So private equity okay. guys are, they're like operational ninjas, right? They go into companies that are already pre-existing. They, they infuse capital, they infuse their operational expertise, and their whole objective is to take something that they believe is being mismanaged and undercapitalized and kind of right the ship and ultimately uh, sell at, you know, five, six, seven, eight X of what they purchased it for. Right. Um, so even when you're dealing in this spectrum of like the smartest, most like, I guess, seasoned businessmen, when they go in to buy already existing companies and apply the resources and the expertise and the capital um, to get it to a point of where they believe it should be, um, their general exit timeframe is five to seven years, right? And these are like the best of the best type people. Um, so it's it's really important to okay. like look at those data points, internalize them and understand those data points because the reality is, again, we filter the expedience of what it takes to ultimately get to the end goal. And um, it's it's kind of like a really bad trick that I think is played on entrepreneurs or people that have an idea and think that, hey, sure. you know, um, th this is my life calling. Um, what people don't realize is like the other side of the story where it's like, bro, or, or sis, right? Or right. Like, you have a fucking journey ahead of you. And um, if there's not like just this unrelenting passion and determination um, and, you know, a strong business plan and the right foundation, um, you know, potentially the right partners, I kind of have my theory on partners versus solo entrepreneur uh, ship as, sure. as uh, you know, a bifurcated category, we'll call it, but um, it, it really is a very arduous journey that um, there's no accelerant to it, unfortunately. It's, and unless you create some wacky thing, it's it's like almost the equivalency of like winning the lottery, right? right. Um, so like the odds are stacked against you based upon what the like standard um, data would suggest the expectations are so um, right get rich quick isn't a thing unless you're like taking shortcuts scamming people like do, do yeah. some like oddball crazy shit so, right um yeah right. You, you really gotta get in your head on it and ensure that like in hey, the market seeing how it plays take. out yeah otherwise well and something that even came to me as you were talking it. there you know is you know we're talking about this in the aspect of the business and I'm even thinking about like Shark Tank, which, you know, is, uh, you know, entrepreneur's wet dream. And if you even like distill that show down, it's, 
you, it, it would lead you to believe that these sharks are spending 10 to 15 minutes with entrepreneurs to understand, not even 10 to 15 minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes to understand their product and then offer them, you know, these hundred thousand dollar deals. But then when you go and do your research, it's like an hour long interview that for each individual person and they wrap up like four of them in, you know, a 30 minute time right, span, right. maybe 22 minute time span. Um, yeah. And, and so I think that would also just add to the idea of this just super quick, super fast thing. And I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. We want everything faster. I remember like right. my phone was taking like five seconds to make something happen. I'm like, I want it to happen in two. It's like, right. We, it, it's almost like this, like it's a pleasure trap of some sort where, you know, it's, it's in everything. Right. And then, you know, if we distill it down for entrepreneurship, it's like, you get it, you see it just replicated throughout it. Because I mean, I've worked on several businesses now and even, you know, you, you have no idea that the issues that are going to come up or the things that are going to make an issue. And, you know, if you're truly, you really get tested with, if you're truly dedicated to solving that market issue, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a delicate balance of dedication, persistence, um, belief. I mean, it's, yeah, it, like I said, it, it, it's not for the faint of heart, man. And and there's actually a really great podcast. Um, it's called How I Built This. And okay. I've heard of it. You know, earlier on, yeah, and Guy Raz, uh, guy is real solid. I mean, he he knows how to really uncover um, some of the, I guess, abstract is the best way to put it. But when I first moved out to San Diego, um, that podcast was on repeat, essentially, like everywhere I drove, um, you know, to and from the office, I would listen to, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes of that podcast. And um, you hear the common theme, right? right. It's like he's interviewing people right. like Mark Cuban, you know, uh, the founder of Dry Bar, the founder of Seth and Barry of Honesty. I mean, like big brands that, that we know we engage with every day. And they all have the same story, right? It's like, right. They all have that one moment where it's like, this is a make or break moment, you know, and they, they all kind of take the position of like, well, fuck it, let's burn the ships. And there's no option to going back. Like we're, we're going to go to war and either we're going to get killed or we're going to come out victorious. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very inspirational and it's very real. And I think that's kind of what I always appreciated about that particular podcast was, um, they're not sugarcoating it, right? Like, if right. you truly think you're just going to zip on through and, you know, get to the other side with, you know, your millions of dollars, it's like, m maybe you can, but right. if I was in your position and that's how I'm going into it with that mindset, I'm just going to buy a ton of scratch offs and, you know, hope for the best because it's your odds are what essentially you're doing. the same. Yeah. And I'd rather have fun. Do yeah. the scratch off that like be sitting at home miserable. It was instantaneous, you know, instantaneously yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah. to putting a yeah. couple of years into it, you know? Yeah. But, but hence is the problem here, right? right. So we're, right. we're validating, you know, that instant gratification concept that we've grown accustomed to. And um, unfortunately it's, we, we all desire instant gratification, right? Um, yeah. It's almost whether like you go to the bar talking to your right. girl, you want the number, like, you know, well, but it's starting like, a business, but it's like the better things. It's almost like the better things in life come to those who wait. Always. It's like, there's like this patience that, you know, it's, I'm sure there's a quote in there somewhere that I've heard before, but it's like, you know, people who wait or are able to delay the instant gratification, the thing on the other side of it is almost always better. You know, it's like, you see this shortcut. I mean, you see it in every industry, right? You can see it in the health industry where it's like, take this pill and you'll be better. You'll be thinner. You'll be bigger. Right. right. It's like, Okay, sure, like maybe, but like at the end of the day, it's, you know, wouldn't you rather figure out that process? It's like in falling in love with the journey almost as um, I know the quotes like uh, the journey is the destination. It's like, right. you know, we would just want to skip over it and get to the destination. And it's like, well, like if you're not enjoying the process, then the destination is almost useless to you. Like it holds no value. If you were to just show up somewhere, you know, then then what are like, then what's the point almost? Yeah, and I think the best correlation to that, um, and, and I've known a lot of people that fall victim to what I'm about to say here, um, it's it's 
rich kids that were born into, you know, this supreme level of wealth. Right. And um, there's one person in particular that's top of mind. Um, and it's like the satisfaction is never there because everything you just mentioned, like this particular person, like they've tried their hands in four or five different things, which um, I value their effort, right? right. The challenges, everything was like very quick. Like I want to be a YouTube star. So I'll create this video and then, you know, my dad will pay for it to be the advertised video on the landing page of YouTube. And it's like, this person was constantly met by failure after failure after failure. Um, and I, I, I look at that dynamic and it's like, fuck, like, here's a person when you're younger, you look at, you're like, wow, you know, they have it pretty good. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's that instant gratification. Like, you know, the, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the destination is the journey. Right. Right. Um, I think the way that we appreciate success is by experiencing failure, right? It's like, how do you yeah. appreciate a good relationship with someone? It's by having a bad relationship with someone. And it's it's no different. I mean, we're we're all, you know, psychologically built the same way. It's sure. like we have these desires and expectations. And again, like look at superstardom, like the 27 club for celebrities, like these are people that were thrown into a environment at a very early age and that's all they ever knew and then they get to your point where you know they're in their late 20s and it's kind of like well, i've left? done everything i've yeah fucked every girl i've done every drug i've you know traveled everywhere in the world and it's like well now what right, right. Like, without having that balance you're not really able to appreciate the things that are good in life so and it, i think there's like a very heavy correlation there between like business relationships and just like general human psychology. Right. And the two things that I'm thinking of, um, on this topic is number one's a story. And it's, uh, a buddy of mine who, when I lived in San Diego, he was, uh, he let, he was my neighbor and he lit or he used to work at one of the fancy hotels downtown. I'm not sure exactly which one, but I remember him telling me that Snoop Dogg would usually come, um, to this hotel and stay there. And he was like a bellhop or something. And I remember him telling a story of one time uh, Snoop Dogg's kids were like, yo, man, like, is there anything to do in this town? And the guy, his name's Joe. He was like, uh, yeah, man, like we got jet skis. We got a boat. We got like this and that. And they're like, man, like I'm tired of riding jet skis. They're like, man, like, yeah, you know, yeah. like the boat's like nothing, you know? And it's, you know, you get everything at such a young age and almost like it, it doesn't make it worth it anymore. You don't realize the value of it. You, you just almost, and I can't relate to it, but it feels like you almost can't imagine the value of it because, and here's another thing I heard Dan Bilzerian say that was like quite profound. It's, he talks about how, um, you know, if I forget what interview it was in, but he talked about how, you know, if you're a high school kid and you get a brand new car, if that brand new car is, you know, let's say like a Toyota Camry or something. That was my first car. So I think that's why I thought of it. You know, you're, you're at like a tent, you know, in your life, you're like, I just got my first car ever. This is sick. I can drive myself to school. This is awesome. And then if you give that kid a Ferrari, well, he's still going to be at a 10. The problem right. is, is you now have trained the brain that you expect almost like a Ferrari every time. And now you're at, let's say the top of the ladder and there's really nowhere else for you to go at this point. Like, and that's the analogy he usually makes is, you know, success is like climbing this ladder where you want to just keep getting tens in your entire life. You don't want to get the best 10. You want to get the 10 of tens. You want to get that Camry of tens. And then maybe you get a Range Rover of tens, you know, and you build your All way right. up to the Lamborghini of tens. And, you know, he attributes it that that's kind of the, you know, the way he described it. And it really resonated with me. It was like, holy shit, man. Like, that's some, yeah. I didn't expect a playboy to have that profound knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, he likely has that profound knowledge because of how his life experiences have been. I right. mean, you look at him and it's like, he's the ultimate alpha male. And 
in his pictures and in his videos, sure. he he doesn't seem satisfied, right? He just seems like, ah, this is another day, another day on the job. Right. Like, all these beautiful women, like shooting guns, driving nice cars, being in nice houses. But there, there's almost like a weird sadness that I see when I look at him, where it's just like, the what guy else? just is going through, you know, just a life at this point. There's like, Early on when he started, it, it was a different story. Like right. that, that was like ultimate, ultimate. And um, I think just with time, it's just become boredom, right? It's just like, all right, like what what ten chicks are going to be around me today? Right. What car am I going to drive? What car am I going to you know rent next month to stay in? I mean, his Bel Air mansion was. I think they were paying like three hundred grand a month. He didn't own it, but he was renting it for almost a half a million dollars a month, and it's like. Won't get better than that, dude. You have like a 50,000 square foot home, like right? private chef, you know, beautiful pool, like everything you could want. So it's almost like being on vacation in perpetuity where, again, you don't, you don't right. have that differentiation. There's no like a lens that you can put on for a moment in time and then take off. It's almost like a, a super pill that people get addicted to, but then... Right like addiction if if you can't keep refueling it with like drugs let's say you ultimately od and now you're gone but you can't like over fuel an addiction to like nice th like you, you can't go any further down that road if that makes sense right so at a certain point it like runs out because like i mean yeah with, it's a dead end right ultimately. with heroin you can always do more heroin until you're dead but <laughs> yeah, yeah you know with, right with money there's a certain point where you can just buy whatever you want and it's like Right. Okay. Great. I can buy whatever I want. Now what? And it's like, it, it, it's, I remember seeing, it's such a weird paradox. Cause it's like, Oh, money doesn't buy you happiness. But it's like, I, I think what, and I remember seeing a quote somewhere and it's just the idea that like, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness, but money gives you freedom and time to find happiness, I believe. And so, right. Right. you know, if you got all the money, you got all the free time, you can find what's going to make you happy in life. And the problem is, is I believe in our society, we're just so fixated on the, you know, nine to five schedule and the um, living paycheck to paycheck that we never really accumulate the ability to break free from that pattern. And I mean, it, it strangles us. It honestly strangles us till we're 60 and then you're 60 and you're like, well, I've done everything yeah. in my entire life for this point. And, and now what, I mean, you got the last 20 years of your 30 years of your life to try to be happy and you don't know because you're too old to be able to figure out what makes you happy because your, your neural pathways have been so ingrained with what you've always done. It right. makes it hard for you to change. Right. Yeah. And, and I think to that point, um, it's it's suitable for the large majority of people. I mean, I I I kind of laugh about it, but whenever I make a trip to a local mall, whether it's you know in San Diego uh, heading down to Fashion Valley or over here heading to Riverside or you know Bloomingdale's up on 59th, um, you just really see like people for what they are, and it's it's scary, dude. Like. Right. Even like the simplest of things, like, you know, this one mall has like one way, you know, up and down and you see person after person going up the wrong way, then realizing, backing up, backing into spot. You know, it's just like this, this mass like autopilot that so right. many people are on and it hands me a laugh because that, that is like a majority of society. People are just like very numb and they they accept right. and it's not a bad thing if that is comfort for you right like if you came from a certain environment and that was normal and you want to maintain that lifestyle right buy a home in that town and raise your kids there like that's perfectly suitable but um i i think again there's like this weird paradigm shift going on where people are seeing like it's that greed is coming into the equation where it's always existed, but the accessibility hasn't always been so great. So it's it's almost like shaking up society where people that should just kind of be following the path are like, oh wait, like I can do more. But the reality is like they're being fed bad information to make their decisions on. Um, and then those that are capable of doing it, you know, it's like, are they, in the mindset of, hey, this is going to be a long-term play, and this is everything I need to know going into it. Um, and 
you know, then you have burnout and you have this and that. So it's right. just, it's, it's such a weird world that we're in right now because accessibility is there. Um, people believe that things can just like happen at, you know, the, the drop of a pin and people are, you know, engaging more in, in trying to see what their potential is based upon what they're being sold they want in life, like the bigger house, the nicer car. Um, so it's it, we're in this weird shakeup time where like a lot of young people don't want to like follow the nine to five, but it's kind of a necessity for them to. And well, you don't, I don't know want another to say, way. Like, you don't know another way. So right. it's all you know. So you're just going to keep repeating the patterns that you have. Right. And, and that's, that's part of that, that push and pull, um, where it's like, you know, it's great for everyone to be a visionary and, and go out and try to accomplish something. I, I think that's how like the growth engine of society keeps right. turning. But at the same time, it's like, dude, you, you need people to fill, you know, the, the, the flywheel, right? They like, you need people in these positions. So it's almost like, how much do we really want to promote? this lifestyle versus like just stay who you are like well, guys like you and i we can't be tied down like we we have bigger thoughts our minds sure. fire differently than 90 percent of people so that journey makes sense for people like you and i but you know most people that are just comfortable with like you know like 90 percent of the people we know in san diego it's just like they're totally comfortable with their life and that's cool like that's fucking all. like right. there's part of me that wishes I could be that way where it's like, fuck, like I go to my job nine to five. I, you know, have my Camry. I have my house, a small house. I have, you know, white and kids. And it's like, that's easy. Like that's you have a buddy convenient. in college. I had a buddy who I roomed with in college. Um, I'm actually going to be staying with him in two weeks, three weeks. Uh, but that was his after I remember in college, I started having like these inklings of thoughts, like what you're saying. And I remember even bringing it up to him then, like, I forget what the idea was. Maybe it was something about building something or podcast or who knows what. And I remember him yeah, just yeah. being like, nah, dude, like, I'm just going to graduate with my computer science degree. I'm going to get a good paying job. And I'm just going to like, I'll be fine. Like, I don't really need like all of that stuff. Like I, you know, it's just, you know, he's just, and he's happy. I mean, you know, give the, you know, he's yeah, yeah. happy with everything he wants to do in life. And so, you know, I, and so here's, but one thing you mentioned, right, about the wheel, you used like a wheel mentality or uh, metaphor. Flywheel, baby. The flywheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've talked about this before. <laughs> uh, Here or there. So I, I've had this conversation with people and I think namely my siblings recently. And it's the idea, right, that, and I don't know if this is how you're saying it, but it, the way it, the car conversation ha happened was, not everybody can pursue their dreams almost because we need people to do things that people don't want to do. And actually I had this conversation with my roommate as well, AJ. And it, it, the idea is, was because I was a software engineer. Let's speak for myself. I was a software engineer and I realized I wasn't happy and you know, X, Y, Z things weren't going my way. Um, long story short, I quit. And I was arguing that I think everyone should at least find themselves to the extent that if, if, if you're happy with what you're doing, keep doing it by all means, by all stretch of the imagination. But I argue that I think everyone should be able to be comfortable enough to say one day, like, nope, I'm not, this job isn't me anymore. I'm done. I want to leave. Um, now given for me, it wasn't one day. It was over a couple months. I realized it. And his argument was, is like, well, you know, if you, because I'm a mill, I was in the, I wasn't in the military. I was a military contractor. And so his argument was like, well, you know, if everyone did that, then we wouldn't have anybody to create the weapons to, for America to be the best, you know, military presence on the earth. Um, and I guess, and, and it's like, it's, I think that kind of is a testament to what you're saying. And my thought process is, is that no, I think more that if we at least showed everybody that this is possible, you would have more passionate people working in the military or maybe the half of the force quits. But, you know, if you want to talk about the 80, 20 principle, 80% of them weren't doing shit anyhow. So if half of them quit, then, you know, we're, we're good. Like, you know, it would save money. And then maybe some of them do still love the military, but they don't love exactly what they were doing. And then they pursue something that creates a military 
invention or a military yeah. thing that then even makes us better as a as an outcome of that and you know I, I that's kind of where i'm at in that conversation or that thought process of the flywheel yeah. and 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 you know like there, there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of dynamics at play and um you know i i hear both sides of the story for sure i, I you know something that i i've kind of been putting some thought into and addressing recently is, is just, you know, population, right? Um, if you look at population figures, like on a global scale and, you know, distill it down to um, a national scale, uh, the, the acceleration of population in the world has been bananas. Well, you're I starting think, to plateau. Uh, and that's a scary thing, right? And like I, I have kind of a personal position, like, you know, I'm not in a very serious relationship with anyone. I don't think I want to have kids because I'm, I'm kind of like a pragmatic person. And it's like, do I want to like add to this issue? Right. And, and the same reasons why like Musk and Bezos and uh, Virgin, you know, they're, they're all going to space because we are running out of space and natural resource, not space necessarily, but like natural resources to support. And when, once you kind of start looking at, like, I, I think the best example was back in like 2008, 2009, when we went through our, our great recession, right? The entire economy tanked, uh, all big businesses um, kind of rethought their, their um or charts, right? And it's like, sure. how many people can we trim off of our org chart? And, um, you know, the, the layoffs are massive. And even still to this day, 10, 12 years since the Great Recession, um, those jobs have not come back up to full, like, pre-recession numbers, right? And following that episode, we had this renaissance period of all these big tech companies like you know your ubers and your lifts and your airbnbs all you know present themselves into the marketplace so we we found ourselves from like 2010 up until current day in what's known as the gig economy right so it's right. like you can't get a job so you get a gig um, there's no benefit, health benefits, there's no 401k, there's no, you know, loyalty, like all these challenges that don't exist. So um, gig economy created 2010, still exists today. That takes up a lot of the workforce, right? But then when you start looking at the job economy today, you know, we had our big pullback in the market in like March, February of 2020 because of COVID. And, you know, we've been in this bull market again um, right. where, uh, markets closing at all-time highs every day for the past 18 months which to me is a bit ludicrous but it's the power of the machine so i, I don't question it i mean i'm invested so I, you know, <laughs> I'm laughing my way all the way to the bank yeah. but, um I, I i think um what i find really interesting in in this new kind of environment since we'll call it post-covid but we'll call it instead just like post-March 2020, is that highly skilled jobs have been at an all-time high. Um, the amount of people that could fill these, uh, call it higher brain positions that are like technically well, what skill set. What constitutes that? It, it's just based upon what your skill set is. So if, if I'm looking at like a sales job, for instance, like, Anyone can get a sales job, right? You just go in, you you know, talk well, present yourself well, you'll get a chance, right? But when you're talking about like industries that you're working in, or like I'm predominantly what I focus on every day is uh, growth marketing and uh, product launch, like go to market strategy. So, you know, I had a company reach out to me a couple, maybe like two weeks ago at this point, huge private equity company based out of the Bay Area, and they found me on. Uh, LinkedIn, they reached out to me, requested an interview. And I was like, you know what, I'll speak to him. I'm not looking for a job, but just sure. to gain a sense of, of what the opportunity is. And when I graduated college, if you were to be on PE track, that was like the ultimate, right? Like that is the best opportunity going. What's PE? We're 
Uh, private equity. Oh, okay. So where they were looking to hire me would have basically counted my past, you know, 10, 11 years of my professional career as being on a PE track. And they would have taken me from like entry Jeez. level and jumped me to director level. Jeez. Because what they're looking for are people that can provide this digital marketing, um, like strategic skill set right. to accommodate the businesses that they're investing in to help grow these digitally native businesses. So, you know, my brother, he works for HubSpot and uh, he's a, you know, kind of high up manager over there. He has a team of about 12 uh, that report to him. And he tells me he gets hit up every single day on LinkedIn from uh, what's known as MarTech companies, which is like marketing technology. It's like a huge booming industry right now. Uh, it's kind of um, cutting out people and putting in technologies um and he's getting hit up all the time so you you look at these like desirable right. skill sets but you also look at you know the supply in the market and the demand is like way up here and the supply is way down here so again there's like this weird intervention that needs to take place where like 90 percent of people are just suitable for either a gig job or, you know, kind of starting off with a company, building, you know, your your presence there and kind of getting promoted every few years, right. and just going through the ranks. But there's like this this massive gap between like like people that are capable of doing jobs um, versus, you know, the jobs that are being offered in the marketplace. So you look at population. And I know this is like so abstract, but like it, it's pretty fundamental because you look at population, right? We have a growing population. The the workforce that you know can support further growth in these Renaissance type sectors like Martech, um, the supply isn't in the market because people don't have the skill set for whatever reasons. You know that's a whole nother conversation, and you, you kind of have the settling thing where again like. Too many people, too little gig jobs, not enough people for these jobs. So you kind of have this like weird Venn diagram where like it's it's pure chaos. And I don't I don't see that getting better anytime soon because like how does it become better? Things become automated, you know, workers aren't getting these actual nine to five jobs, they're getting gig jobs, employees that are trying to drive, you know, their growth trajectories of their businesses can't find people that have the skill set to plug into these positions. Right. So it's like this whole mishmash of, right. of shit that's going on where it's like, I, I, I don't know, man. It keeps me up at that. It's like, <laughs> what are we doing? They're like, you know, it's- Could be your next we, entrepreneurial we too, business. Figure that well, big solution. Well, too fast and too big. Well, that's what's crazy that about- issue. That's the crazy thing about the internet is it's, it's really amplified all of those things that you're just highlighting there. It's really put an emphasis on like just our, our ability to communicate. You don't like, look what we're doing right now. We're having an intellectual discussion where you're in New Jersey and I'm in Pennsylvania. Right, right. I mean, you know, soon I'm going to be interviewing people and I can be in Brazil and go train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, come here and interview someone in California or Pittsburgh. Right. It's like, you know, it's crazy. And I think to your point, um, you said something that was really, uh, that I'm glad you said was about the automation, which is a huge part of this too. Um, coming from a software engineering or computer engineering degree, but software engineering profession, dude, so many things are going to get automated from just truck drivers to Uber drivers to hell, maybe even waiters and waitresses. Um, and there's two concerns there, right? Number one, I, barely anybody knows how to code. And I mean, like the number is so small. Like, so first of all, if you're listening to this, learn something about coding. <laughs> if you learn anything from this podcast, learn something about coding, no matter what you do. I could not emphasize that more. Um, but number two is, is the removal of the human experience, right? Like if I get an Uber driver, it's just me. If I get an Uber car and it's just me, no more human experience. You know, it's, if I, you know, go to a restaurant and I go by myself, there's no human experience. And, you know, again, I think the huge thing that this whole COVID situation has taught us is we need human interaction. I mean, we are a, we are a human conversation. So what is it? Social, we are social animals. We're social creatures and we need to interact. We need to have these conversations. We literally go insane. Like there's a reason that solitary confinement is the worst possible thing. It's just, it's right. not, you know, at a certain level, it's just not reasonable to have that. 
and you combine that with the idea that you know nobody knows autom like these skills these coding skills you know it's I mean, I think it's just, it's a recipe for, I don't want to call it disaster. It's a recipe for disaster, yeah, but yeah. you know, I don't want to put that negative light on it it's because yeah. as big as a disaster it could be, there has to be opportunity there as well for us to learn more either about the humans or be able to grow as a society. And I mean, you know, this isn't something that one of us can fix. Like we do need everybody, all hands on board for, you know, what's about to happen in the next 10, 15 years. I mean, it's, it's really going to be wild. Like, and I even know in the crypto space, um, with smart contracts, I mean, not to go down that whole rabbit hole, but just lawyers will likely need to learn how to code in the future. Like just because that's where it's all going to make this coded, you know, system where, um, you know, contracts are written in code and it's, it's just what is going to happen as our future progress. And I mean, if lawyers have to learn how to code, you know, it's just, it's the entire rabbit hole of everybody will need to know something about coding. And I mean, there's that. And then the automation factor where, or the human factor that, you know, it's something we need to at least have our eye on and get ready for, because I see that as being a pretty big issue. And now that, you know, where we're going with, uh, you know, humanity. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're, we're kind of have that Joe Rogan vibe going on right now where it's like this abstract conversation and, you oh, know, like the reality right, you would even, is, you would even uh, compare my podcast. <laughs> and then you're, you're, I think, you know, by uh, episode two, you'll have a couple million uh, subscribers. So oh, you're well hell. on your way. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the reality is it's like, you know, it's kind of the old saying, it's like, if you can't beat them, join them. Right. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not like, um, cemented in my thoughts by any degree, you know, I'm, I'm just like pragmatic in the way I think about things. Like I don't get involved with political conversations. I don't get involved with religious conversations because, you know, the irony of it is like, these things like religion, which is supposed to be great, like more people have died in the name of religion than any, like probably of like the history of cancer, right? So you, sure. you just kind of look at it and it's like, all right, like I'm not even gonna touch that, right? I, I'm just gonna like stay in my lane, like, you know, enjoy life for what it is and not get so wrapped around the axle of like what these problems are. And I, I, I think that's actually a pretty good segue of why I decided to do what I'm doing in life. It, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you have one life to live, um, I think it's okay to be selfish, but I think you need to be cognizant of, you know, action reaction. Right. Um, you know, like when I say selfish, like, I don't think I ever want to have children. Like that, that's like a selfish thing. Like, you know, it's like, you want to bring someone into this world. This is like a, a great miracle type thing. But I just look at it like, well, you know, I, I have one life to live. Like, do I really want to be, you know, kind of bogged down by having, you know, a wife and kids and, you know, a home and vacations. And it's like, I look at all my friends doing that and everyone's pretty like, eh, well, this is really what I signed up yeah, for. Right? I think there's an element. It's, it's no different than business. It's like sure. the same shit. So like sure. you have one life, enjoy it. Don't, don't get wrapped around the axle on, you know, politics and religion and who has what and who's doing what it's like, you know, right. you're, you're well, a designer, create your own design right do your own thing i mean create a podcast you know stuff like that yeah, yeah exactly yeah. i mean this is living proof i you mean you're, you're living it which you know i'm i'm, I'm so fired up that yeah. you've started this journey and you have pretty good plans going into it i mean like yeah not i, I was talking to a guy i work with in new york and i was telling him about you and i was like yeah my buddy you know uh, he he thought it was impressive not impressive but just like a kind of a big deal that I was born and raised on the East Coast and moved out to San Diego. And I go, yeah, let me one up that. My buddy Clay, Pittsburgh, San Diego, now to uh, Brazil. And he's like, oh, geez, like <laughs> that, that like is that's that's big. Right. And right. like his reaction is commonplace. Like how many people can really shake up their life narrative and, and do that? Uh, I mean, especially I in the 20s, late 20s. I argue yeah. anyone can do it. Well, they can. It comes out like, of mindset. You need to design your life that way, right? Yeah. I mean, it took time. I remember, um, and this is a great point. I remember it would have been March of 2018. 
uh, me and my roommate, AJ, we went to um, Brazil for carnival. And it was like the week before. And I, we were walking around Florinopolis. It was just so beautiful. Just everything was so fresh. Everybody, I mean, the infrastructure obviously wasn't like it was in America. But aside <clears throat> from that, like, the people were so lively. It was so just immersive. I had so much energy just being there that to me, it was like, okay, I need to orientate my life such that I can live wherever I want, whenever I want, um, you know, without, you know, being constrained to a job. And it took me, where are we at here? August of almost September or August 31st. So it's September of 2021. So what would that have been over a little over three years, three and a half years. And now, um, you know, it, I just remember just having that thought and it's a and hell. It was a hell of a journey. I mean, I, I did a couple right. and it might've been around the time we kind of met because I would have been yeah. starting out some different business ventures, starting like a drop shipping site, starting, um, that transition into boon to builder, uh, which then transitioned into Dolo, you know? So it's like, you know, it's this whole Clayton's process. Meat. A Clayton's <laughs> meat. Uh, love the plug. Uh um yeah. yeah but don't forget that one <laughs> never do ever do that's like a little yeah, yeah. when they when they find it on the instagram yeah. and stuff that's a little yeah. like you know for them kind of thing just like the little sprinkle yeah, on yeah, top. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but i mean it's just a creative process and you know if you go back to and here's the thing and this tie this can go full circle here where let's say it was march 2018 and i had that thought like oh, okay i'm gonna I'm going to, you know, drop everything I'm doing and move to Brazil. It's like, well, if I was instantaneously given that opportunity, it's like, well, would I have grabbed onto that opportunity or know that I saw it whenever it presented itself? You know, because I would argue that it, it took this long process of, you know, happening and the world unfolding around me in order for me to put my ducks in a row and to align with sick. I can now move to Brazil and live there for probably two years on just my savings. It's like, you know, what if I put two years into this podcast, man? And I just get, you know, I'm sure I can make some passive income off of it within that time frame. It's like, dude, now my whole world is set up to just live however I want to live and wherever I want to live when I want to be where, wherever, you know? And so yeah. it, it kind of, you know, to go full circle, it takes time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, three years in the planning phase, right? Yeah. So when you start talking about planning versus execution, like the execution phase for you might be the rest of your life. It's just like, this That's is what I, I do it. now and yeah. I'm, I'm just executing every day. So, yeah, but it, there's, there's no better feeling um, than just kind of living life on your terms right. um, while being respectful of like the greater society, I guess. Oh, it's for kind sure. Of a caveat there that you want to be cognizant of well, because you don't want to uh, be yeah, like for sure. I mean, completely I, rogue in society, right? Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, yeah, that's a definitely a great thing to point out. And I mean, I think I'm certainly at a point where, you know, there's two elements here, right? One, of course, I want to help as many people as possible. And I, I, honestly, I hope this podcast kind of does something along those lines. Someone listens to this conversation. Maybe it inspires them to start figuring out entrepreneurial stuff and puts them on this path that can take them to traveling the world because that's what they want to do. And then the other thing is, is that you really need to know kind of who you are in order to enable that to happen, right? Like, you know, you can't just, you know, wake up one morning and be like, oh yeah, I, would, I want to be, uh, I want to live in Spain the rest of my life or something. It's like, if you have that instantaneous thought, good for you and act on it. But if you don't truly know yourself, it comes back to that burnout. You know, it's like, why are you doing what you're doing? And it's, I think there was a, there was a good book. I forget which one, but it talks about the why of, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. And if you focus on the why it kind of helps you with like that destination. Like, you know, it's like, why are you doing this? Are you just doing it for the money? Like, it's totally cool. If that's the answer, just be honest with yourself. If you're doing it just for the money, okay, do it just for the money. You know, are you, doing it for this? Are you doing it for that? I mean, just do it for that and be honest with yourself about why you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, to tie this back to the, you know, helping people, I mean, part of this is a, I love the conversations I have with certain people, you obviously you included. And I'm just like, I, we got to record this and get this out to people because ah. I think there's a lot of truth ah. and a lot of learning that can happen from these types of conversations. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm totally with it. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those crazy 
just life challenges where it's like you're never done learning you're never done exploring right. you know it's like jobs that like stay curious right? right um and yeah i think you you need to like have those those constant like sensors in your body being stimulated or else you're just kind of like an empty seat walking around all day where it's like you're just numb you're numb to everything it comes the matrix yeah, it's like there, there's no feeling anymore. And, you know, it's weird. You look at, like, the biggest growth in, like, depression in the United States. It's like, what? Or in the world, right? Um, every day I'm on, you know, following Kevin Love, my, uh, you know, psychic um, on Instagram. And, like, he started some, you know, uh, kind of, like, meditative type thing to help, like, relax and um, allow awesome. people to just, like, chill out right well it's it's good thing but it's 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 a uh, a band-aid to a bigger problem and i i think you know the bigger problem of society it's like dude we we all just kind of get numb right and you can get you know anxiety or uh or depression right through being numb and sure. just kind of not feeling anything or being like high caliber like not meeting your goals and like driving, 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 and, and just being met with like constant disappointment. And it's just like, you go back a hundred years. It's like people didn't fucking have anxiety. People didn't like, maybe they did, but it wasn't like real. Right. Well, like, or it was like, years Oh shit, ago, this people... tiger's about to eat me. Like, <laughs> well, exactly. My point. It's like, you know, you're in France at like yeah. a steel and you're worried about getting shot. Like that, right. that's something you should be fearful right. of. Or like you said, like a, a tiger is about to, you know, bite your skull off. Like, okay. Like that, that's a good reason to have anxiety. But today it's like, it's manufactured. Oh, dude, right? it's all in the it's head, like man. People... It's all in the head. Yeah. It's, what if, it's what, like if, what if, survival, what if, right? what if, what if I hear yeah. that shit all the time. It, and it's like to the point where I'm just like, I got to slow people down and you can hear me getting worked up now. It's, it, it gets oh, me yeah. worked up. Cause it's like, it's such a, it's such a symptom in our society of just like, well, what if this yeah. happens? What yeah. if that happens? What it's like, then we'll handle it when it happens, but it hasn't <laughs> happened. So why are we getting anxious and worried about things that haven't happened? It's like, right. well, what if a meteor crashes into earth tomorrow? Like, okay, well, <laughs> this was all, you know, we get to restart again. <laughs> like, let's hope, yeah, you know, some fungus yeah. stays around and creates humans again, because, you know, that's, that's the what if of our scenario. It's like, you can't, you know, it, it's based on, I think most of the time I've hear, heard it in my life, it's based around fear of, you know, whatever, what if, you know, right. what if I run out of money? What if, you know, you, right. You know, I, and, and that's probably on. like 90% of the fear, right? right? So it's like, where, where did that fear develop? Like it's, it's a fear of not being safe, um, sure. like financially and being able to survive. And maybe physically, um, I think it's that, valid. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of why like people just do the nine to five, like, let me float, a, you know, fly under the radar, like, no one knows I'm here. Right. I'm just over here doing my job. And that, was like, me. that, that, yeah, that pulls that, you know, 800 pound, you know, elephant off your back and allows you to like, well, it replaces have one it. thing in your life. Yeah, I'd argue yeah, it replaces yeah. it. I, in the last couple months of my job, I wasn't working as many hours as I probably should. And even though be I be careful, dude. yeah. <laughs> They're, and they're going to hit you up and say, yeah, hey, well, you, but here's you the thing, <laughs> but here's the thing is I was getting all my work done. That was handed to me. I just, I could have always done more work, but the thing is, is, you know, let's say and I'm being very conservative here. Let's say I was working for 30 hours a week and I was telling them 40. Um, then I still felt like this, you know, it, you're talking about how it's like an elephant on your back, but it just, it replaces it, man. Like, I was getting so energetically drained doing, you know, if, if you talk to someone, you're like, Oh, if you're only working at a job that, you know, for 10 hours a week and they're paying you blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, like you should be happy about that. Why would you quit? Why would you keep doing it until there's something else that arises? But it's like, dude, you don't understand like doing even, you know, the bare minimum just to get by, it still puts this like, there's this like tension of energy that it puts on you because you, at least for me, 
let me speak for myself, because I realize like there's something more out there. Like subconsciously, it's like, hey, dude, you're not doing what you should be doing. You're, you know, kind of digging around, let's say. And I mean, rightfully so, but it creates this energetic imbalance within you where it's like, well, you should be working 40 hours and doing overtime and doing this and doing that. And it's like, but I don't want to. And so it creates this internal just thing that just drains you and it, it it drained the shit out of me for the last two months that I worked. And I remember I had this little epiphany, um, which is how I came to the epiphany is an incredible story, but I came to an epiphany where it was like, I have to quit, you know? And I was so energized, so energized that weekend. It was incredible. And then Monday morning, put in my two weeks and it was just the energy just kept flowing. I mean, and then some things happened throughout that. It was the next two weeks that really tested me. It was really tested like, hey, man, like you don't have a job lined up. You don't have this lined up. You know, well, what if this? What if that? Well, da, da, da. You know, it, it really tests that you're committed to that energetic, you know, frequency of the universe that's going to help you pull off with, you know, these great things. And it you know, I'm so glad that I just, everything unfolded the way it did. I, you know, learned tremendously, but to get back to your point, I mean, you know, you remove that elephant almost of society, you remove the societal element because on paper, right? People are like, Oh, what do you do for a living? Well, I write software yeah, yeah. for remotely piloted air class in the military and like people's eyes would light up and be like, Holy shit, dude, that's sick. And to me, I'm like, well, it's fun to do. I would never say this, but to me, it's like, Oh yeah, it's fun to do. But like, I'm never, um, you know, I, I was getting drained from, you know, who I was, you know, the workplace and everything and what we just discussed. And it's like, it removes that societal, um, you know, elephant. But at the end of the day, you got to confront yourself. You're the one you come home to. And so now it's like, oh, well, what do you do? It's like, well, not that. <laughs> and so then yeah. it becomes like, well, are you doing what you're doing for society or are you doing it for yourself? And when you get in that trap that you're doing it for society, you're going to sacrifice happiness 10 times out of 10. And man, I, you know, I honestly don't care anymore if I, you know, if I, it's not going to happen, but if, what if I end up not having any money in the world and I have to go back to a nine to five job? I mean, you know, I left college with like, you know, maybe 50 K in debt and then I bought a car. So add another 20 K and it's like, you know, I found a way out of that in four years. And it's like, you know, I, you know, obviously now I'm in the net positives. And so it's like, dude, if I ever find a way to zero, like, you know, I'll do what has to do. I have to do to not get there. And I just, yeah, you know, I don't see it ever being an issue again. And so it's like, it's incredible. I mean, yeah. So you, you got to make sure you're doing what you're doing because you want to do it and not because society wants you to do it. Yeah. No, it's, it's well put. I mean, when I started my business, I uh, came home for the holidays and, you know, we're in a neighborhood and I know all my neighbors and, uh, you know, it's the same question. Well, what do you do? And, well, I'm doing that. Well, uh, is that really the best use of your time? And, your you know, everyone's so quick to give you advice because right. they they want to feel like validation themselves. And, and sure. what I realize is it's just it's deflection. It's like they're disappointed with kind of where they're at in life and they feel like if they can provide advice to someone that almost is kind of this uh it validates know, father son relationship yeah it, it validates them it, it, it makes them feel like hey like i wasn't able to do it but i was able to learn and instill that but even even like the data share is ridiculous it's like what what i've experienced in life like even if i were to give you all the tools in the world personal training and everything, you might not have the same experience and, and it's vice versa, sure. right? Like we, we're, we're like individuals, right? And we have things that we're good at and things that we're not good at. And, um, you, you can't like force the fit, um, especially like in the path of, uh, being an entrepreneur. I mean, it's, it's a very delicate experience in life and yeah, people that are like constantly asking, like, what do you do? What's your job? Like, well, what's your you're moving to brazil like what are you thinking like yeah, you, sure. you're, sugar now? you're moving down to brazil for two years uh, come on let me hit you upside the head and get you straight it's like fuck you bro like, <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm going to experience something that 
you could only hope to experience, right? Right. And that experience, you know, it's it's learning more about myself, what my purpose is, finding that alignment, and and you know, projecting um, how I want to project, not how you know you wanted me to project. And you know, like Gary Vee always talks about, like I'm not really a fan of him anymore. I think his stuff is expired at this point okay. or his pump up speeches and shit, but he, he does always promote the um, position of like, like kind of like, don't let your parents have too much influence. On right. you. Like if you're accepting money from your parents, stop today. Right. Because it's, it's your parents giving you a life or trying to provide you guidance so they can, you know, brag to their friends like, Oh, guess what? Clay is up right. to now. He's a software right. engineer. Isn't that so great? And like, it's it like competition exists like from the point you're born to the point you die but it's similar to like the conversation on politics or religion it's like do you, do you even want to step on that field to compete or do you just want to be the guy that is so focused and doing your thing like fuck everything else like i know who i am what i need to do and and you just go for it and um, it's it's a very tough thing to like kind of take yourself out of the limelight, so to speak, where you're you're almost like reclusive, but you're you're surrounded by people like you know you and I have had a relationship for a couple of years. I think you know when I moved out of San Diego, um, right. we we've kind of leveled up our relationship. Or now, and it's kind of ironic how that works. Where right. now we're talking about business, we're talking about theory, we're talking about putting you know. Our, our actions in place and what I'm working on, what you're working on, like we're, we're having these higher level conversations about things. Um, but you're not someone that is saying you need to do this. And I'm not someone telling you the same thing. We have that mutual right. respect for each other. And I think that's like a good balance, a good cadence of like being confident with what you're doing, being surrounded by the right people. But, you know, people that like intrinsically care about you, whether it's like super close family or like, neighbors or whatever it's they they always want to project onto you because they want to sure. kind of say like oh i know this guy and oh i gave him that advice and that's what he's doing it's like they need that that fulfillment where right and like, i stopped needing that fulfillment so since i don't need that fulfillment i live on the terms i need to live by and it's a beautiful and way I'm to confident live with what i'm doing right but right it's and tough to eclipse that gap, you know? Well, and something I want to focus on here is you talked about alignment and I, I think it's absolutely incredible. When I quit my job, I felt so aligned. And I think that's where all that energy kind of came from. And then now that I'm on the other side of that, realizing like I was, I was at my job so I could tell people that I was a software engineer who write the code <laughs> that flies military drones, right? Like I was doing that for sure. But what is a beautiful thing that happens on the other side of this is you realize when people are telling you things either out of their own insecurity, out of like what you're describing, where it's like, oh, I helped him, or it's, you know, projecting their fears or insecurities, or are they coming from a place of love, compassion, and genuinely trying to help you? Like, you can just, I, I swear, I can now just feel it when someone's talking. It's like, you're saying that out of fear, like, and, and don't get me wrong, some of right. shit's valid, and people completely understand, like, Maybe they don't completely understand. I mean, a lot of it becomes just habitual nature. It kind of goes back into that rut we were talking about earlier with the matrix. It's like you get caught into this world of just reaction, action, reaction, action, reaction. There's no like creation. There's no, let me sit here. Let me think about what they're saying. Okay. Yeah. They're coming out of fear and like, Hey man, like I, it's like fear's valid, dude. There's a reason we have fear. There's a hundred percent valid reason, but I need to step back and be like, okay, well, your fear is valid, but you know, I'm not going to make a decision based on that fear because either a, I don't view the world that way or B, I'm going to take your fear consideration into account, but I know how I can handle that. If that situation does arise or comes back to the whole thing, the what if thing, it's like, well, if that happens, then, you know, I, you know, you take each situation with a grain of salt because, you know, we can play the what if scenario, but each little what if has all these little like jagged lines that come off of it. And it's like, okay, well, what if, um, I lose all my money? Okay. Well, are you talking about my savings? Are you talking about my investments? Oh, just my savings. Oh, well then I'll probably sell off some investments. Oh, I've lost all my investments. 
well, do I have like a car that I can sell? You know, so it's that what if game. It's just, it's a, and there's a, there's a, the, what is it? The kiss principle, keep it simple, keep it stupid, simple, or keep stupid it simple. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like you make these scenarios in your head and you have all these branches that go off it. Well, what if this, what if that, what if that, and you go down that whole rabbit hole and that's what creates anxiety in the present moment. And shout out the power of now book by Eckhart Tolle. You know, it's all about just living in the present moment. Like what can you control in this exact moment? Well, in this exact moment, I get to host a podcast with Kevin Love and nothing else in the world matters because if I start two things, one, if I start thinking about my fears of Brazil, if I haven't, let's say, let's say you start thinking about fears of Brazil, it's going to detriment this podcast. Nobody's going to listen. Everyone's going to be like, what the fuck was Clayton talking about? Was he even listening to Kevin? Like, you know, he wasn't even present for that conversation. Number one. And then number two, it like splits you, it creates anxiety within myself. I'm now worried. And you know, it just, it's almost just not a way to live. And I guess the point is, is now once you realize it within yourself, you can then see it in other people and then you can discern it as, well, okay, that's a valid, that's a valid fear. Should I be worried about that? You can sit back and be like, okay, maybe I should. Or, you know, what if in two years I go through all my money? Well, you know, I'll figure that out in two years. Like, why would I try to fix that issue now? There's no, there's no logical reason to try to approach it. Like, you know, it's like, well, if I don't say, you know, it's like, I mean, you know, you should save and invest in everything. I'm not saying not to do that, but it's just like, we get too caught up in these what ifs in our life in the past or the future in the past. Well, what if I would have said that? What if I would have done that? doesn't matter, man, you didn't. And you're, you're not going to be able to fix it. Like, so all you can do is live in the present. If you need to apologize, someone do it, whatever makes you feel better. But you know, it's not gonna, it's not going to change what happened. You can only move from this point forward. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, again, like, what do they say? It's like reflection and time is progress, right? So um, re reflection is a super important component. Like, you know, moving on is important, being able to, you know, drop and move. But at the same time, uh, a, a huge core is like reflection, right? Like, how would I have done that differently? Uh, you know, would I have made that same decision? Uh, I, you know, have done X, Y, and Z, right? And and I think it's Dalio that created that. Um, I don't want to call it an algorithm because it's like simple math, but it was like, you know, uh, what was it? It's like reflection and time equals progression or progress. And it's just like a simple little nuanced thing. Like we, we progress based upon time that we're here and, you know, reflecting on everything that has gotten us here, sure. reflecting on a conversation and reflecting on, you know, something we read in the paper. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, there's a, there's how we a, continue to adapt and learn, right? Yeah. There's an interesting quote. It's something along the lines of, I'm going to mess it up. But it's along the lines of like, if you're, if you're spending all of life analyzing life, then you're not living life. Um, if you're not say it one more time, yeah, you caught you on a email or something. If you're spending all of life analyzing life, then you're not truly living. Oh, life. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard that one before. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, I, I, I think that's, that's part of like just how we're built. I mean, there, there's, there's too much that we have to take in every single day. Like our sensory overload is a real thing. Like, sure. You know, if, if, we, if we knew each other, 50 years ago, bro, you'd have to, or let's say a hundred years ago, you'd have to like get on a fucking horse and like, you know, take a yeah. seven day trip, eight day trip to get to where I am. And, you know, I, I would probably be farming and cooking all this like homemade food, like random, whatever, For sure. uh, tending to my farm. Um, so, so like the sensory component there was, was non-invasive. It was just like, things were very subtle. Then you get into cars, you get into airplanes, you get onto a computer, you know, you, you see everything is so big and fast and coming at you. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I think like, I don't know if your nervous system was built to support this sort of like gravity of, of just sensors that were constantly being, you know, attacked by every day. And it's, it's a very real thing. You know, it's, it's insane. I mean, a hundred years ago, like the biggest sensory you'd have is like the fucking sun and the moon and maybe like riding a horse across town. But 
you know, in the day and age we're in right now, it's, it's crazy. So that's why we're always thinking, why, why, or what if, what if, what if, um, because we're, we're, we're exposed to so much and every single thing you're exposed to, there's a million what if questions that you can ask where a hundred years ago, it's like you were exposed to like two or three things a day, right? It's like right. you weren't getting in the on the train to go to the city. You weren't, you know, taking a helicopter to go out to the Hamptons for the weekend. You weren't, uh, you know, um, going online and having video conversations like this. You weren't on your cell phone. It's like, dude, we we are like insanely overwhelmed by um, oh, sure. by by sensory things in society. So it, it creates that what if, what if, what if, and it's tough. Like you, you get stuck in that. And that's why so many people are like, kind of like, all right, I just, I just want to chill. I just yeah. want to have my job and have my car and have my family. Just like, leave me the fuck alone. Like, right. That's how people are. But like, when you step out into the abyss, like where, where I am, where you're heading, well, I'm not there. It's never a destination, but right. where I've been traveling, it's like, it's, it's a really big fundamental shift in, in just the way you go about living and the way you see the world and the way you think about things and it's weird at first because it's you know it's not like you flip a switch and you're there i mean it's like behaviors compounding behaviors and ultimately you, you kind of you know registers and it clicks and um you, you just kind of look at the world like so differently and you, you start to connect dots it's like as a marketer i look at every like i'll go to whole foods and look at every single beverage and i'll you know kind of create the story in my mind of like, what is this beverage all about? And I, I can piece together basically their, their story that's on their website. And then I go to their website and I'm like, oh shit, like I, I nailed it. Yeah. Like, this brand has zero substance. This brand definitely has, you know, two male founders that, you know, were bros in college that decide to do that. Like you can see that imputing through, right. you know, everything in like that's interesting. What I see in, in certain categories. Now, you, and it's just, it's crazy. Do you notice it? Yeah. Do you notice if the ones that like hold more congruency, like the ones where you're like, Oh yeah, those are the two bros in college. And then you check their website and they're like, Oh, we're two bros in college. Do you notice with those ones that hold congruency, if they're more successful? They, they have, um, a good foundational story. You know, you mentioned earlier in our conversation about, uh, like, what's your why, right? If your why is money, that's one thing, right? But if your why is to solve a problem and doing it with your best friend, like you, you, you can feel that energy coming off of these products of like, this means like, this has something you almost like pick the product up and you're like, there's, there's like something here, right? Um, where other products you can tell, like, you poke it with your finger and it's like just window dressing your finger goes right through it. Right. It's paper thin. Like there's, there's nothing to it. And I think that, um, that's a really critical thing. Like, you know, having a reason why you're doing something versus just, you know, pulling something out of thin air and right. saying, oh, I, I just want to capitalize. I just want to make money. That's all I care about. Right. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting point. I mean, yeah, it's really cool. I've never kind of, it's a very entrepreneurial thing to do <laughs> to go into a store and be like, I'm going to figure out what their brand is just based on their imaging. I mean, but yeah, I, but that's, what's so powerful it, about all this, right? Go ahead. It, it gets you into a position to really, um, sharpen your emotional intelligence. Like you mentioned, have a one minute conversation with someone you can tell if they're upset, if they're happy, if they're sad, right. if they're lonely, quicker like, than that, it is. even quicker than that. Yeah. I'd say. But, but that's, that's part of it, right? It's right. just like, it's almost like, you know, you are in the matrix and you're like, yeah, I figured yeah. this out, figured this out. Like, but, but it's great because, you know, I remember in San Diego, there's this girl I used to hang out with, um, before she moved back to like, uh, she was from Dubai. It was like crazy. She was here for grad school, hung out with her a little bit, like super interesting culture. And I remember we were at a bar and, um, it was in PB actually. And, um, there was like a half homeless guy that walked in and sat next to us at the bar. And I was having like a full blown conversation with this guy. And then, um, I think like the next week, maybe we we're at the Del Mar track and we're up in the turf club and, you know, I'm talking to a handful of people there and she kind of pulled me out to the side. She's like, you're like a movie star. Like you, you just like, you can like 
play these roles and like talk to anybody and hold a conversation and just like flow in their world. Right. You know? And I think, I think that's like, once you're kind of in this entrepreneurial world, it's like you learn how to kind of be like a movie star, right? Like what role are you playing? Who do you need to be? Like how important is it that you be that person? And that like adaptability um, with like cognizant awareness of, of like really peaked emotional intelligence. Right. Um, th those are all like really unique skill sets that just like very strong entrepreneurs have. And right. it's, yeah, it's cool. one of those things where like you, you grow towards it. It's now. kind of what makes a successful CEO or even chief level position is it, it's like, you know, so much of it is just the, the idea, right? Or the product or the item. Like it's certainly important to have a good product, but if you don't have somebody at the top of the ladder who knows people and knows how to kind of talk to people or what's going on, kind of like what you're saying. I mean, what you're describing is I, I like if, someone fits exactly what you're saying you give them a good product and it'll be a hundred million dollar company like no doubt in my mind because they understand people and if you understand people you're able to a build out a team to get them on the same page create a mission get them organized get them to do what they want and then the other element is, is you understand your market you understand the people on the market who you're selling to so you can get that product to them so much easier and it's like just fluid and i mean you know, what you're describing is like two things. One, it's like you can operate from a sense of, you know, let's say selfishness. You're not, but I'm saying you can, where it's like, well, I want to get to know all these people because then I can get in their mind and figure out how to, how to manipulate them. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but, yeah. Which maybe there's value to that, but there's also the level of just inter being interested in people and being interested in everybody's story and what's going on in their life. And like, there's just a, there's an element of, there's an element of this world that just kind of opens up once you start putting yourself in that mindset of just like, well, you know, trying to, I remember I, I, I had like a little game I'd play with myself where I would try to make like a cashier laugh. And the goal was, is like between me checking out, it's like, what a fucking yeah. boring job. I remember thinking like, if I was a cashier, yeah. it's the same thing over and over. Like, well, how's your day going? Oh, it's good. All right. Bye. It's uh, like, and you know, there's that awkward moment whenever like that credit card goes in and you guys are sitting there kind of just uh, like, uh, all right, uh, we're uh, waiting on the credit card uh, to process. So I made my uh, goal like, all right, whenever I see a cashier, hang out with a cashier or whatever. I'm going to try to get them to smile or laugh before I leave. And it like, I, it just, it, it, it makes you, it raises that EQ and it really makes you more aware of, okay, here's someone you got to make them laugh instantly, you know, or just like build this camaraderie with them just so quickly. And it snaps them out of the matrix for a couple seconds. Right. 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 You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, uh, I had a coworker, uh, this guy, Bobby, uh, he's a little bit younger than me, but I, I met him out in Monaco out of all places back in like 2014, I want to say, and brought him into that venture that I mentioned earlier in this conversation. He was our creative director. And, um, I remember we'd be in Vegas, like every week, uh, we had business, um, you know, like brick and mortar dispensaries, cultivation production facilities out there. And I, I remember like he was that way, you know, and he rubbed off on me because, We'd like pull up to a light in Vegas and like, I actually have a better story. We were just like cruising in a rental U-Haul van down the strip. Right. And we were coming back over okay. like the highway from like where the palms is. Uh, and, and we come over like that side of 35 to get onto the strip. Like if you make a right, you're right in front of the Palagio and the Palagio, as you know, has the uh, water show. Right. This is so ridiculous. And maybe I'm the only one that finds this funny along with uh, Go for it. We'll see what happens. I'll yeah, add a laugh we, track. We're in this, yeah, let me see if I can add a laugh track. At the yeah, end. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're in this like we're in this U-Haul van and we're just like ripping it um like down in front of uh the Bellagio and we're probably doing like sixty miles an hour, maybe seventy on um, the Las Vegas strip, which like there weren't many cars because they're making the right, so we had like a clear like gunned it so we're in this car everyone's out in front of the bellagio watching okay, this this water display and you just hear this shitty ford u-haul dam like you know like revving up like how slow that it like sure. revs up because it's like 
horsepower heavy. It's not torque heavy. Right. And uh, all of a sudden, he looks at me and goes, watch this. We're doing 70. I'm like, watch this? Like, <laughs> there's more? Right? And he, he takes his foot off the gas and just pulls the e-brake up. Right? So oh, here geez. we are in this van just like sliding in front every single person turns around like what the fuck is that or, it was probably like a 20 second from like 70 to zero e-brake stop right and then he lets the e-brake go hits the acceleration because we got a green light and just take off and he looks at me he's like bro those because <laughs> those people are going to remember this moment for the rest of their lives <laughs> I was just laughing my ass off. <laughs> there we go, baby. Uh, so, no, that was funny, though. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but it's so you true. know, I, I just, yeah, I just look at it, and he would say that a lot. Like, he would do something ridiculous, like we were coming over the Coronado Bridge, and we were in my partner's Range Rover, and he just goes, watch this. And say, he was like a big kid. He stuck his entire body out the moonroof, like, from waist up, and he's just like riding down the Coronado Highway, looking at all the cars, like, and he has this long flowing hair, and he's just like screaming, just like, "How how is everyone? How are you guys doing? What's up? I love California!" And he would like come back in the car and be like, "Yeah, those people are gonna remember that moment for the rest of their lives." That's and, like, so funny. You look at it, and it's like, it's a cool thing to do. Like, maybe a little bit more mature of a version of doing something, but you know, people. People like that, you know, it's like you pull them out of just like the redundancy of everything. You see something crazy and it's like, why not have that crazy thing be something that's like harmless and positive right. versus like, you know, getting people like out to riot some shit or, right. go, you know, fight this person or criticize, you know, someone on Facebook. It's like, you know, it, it, there, there's different ways that we can like you know, well, engage as one's coming and... from a place of love, which is what it sounds like your friend was doing. And right, right, right. from a place of fear, you know, it's like, right. You can, con but people you know? don't need to have fear if they have a love. Right. And if they oh, feel sure. protected and comfortable, sure. fear doesn't exist. And I think that's kind of where the shit has happened. Like when oh, 9 sure. happened, it hit us so close to home. We're right next to New York here. And, mm -hmm. um, the city came together. There was right. like that, like solidarity and like it's a moment I'll, I'll never forget going into the city as a young kid it's like you'd feel it you'd feel that positive energy it'd give you chills right but like in a good right. way oh right? for sure and it's like goosebumps. if 9-11 dude if 9-11 were to happen today like there would probably be a civil war that would erupt people wouldn't unite they would you know box off and say no fuck this well fuck you fuck this you know mm. and it's like i i just feel like we've lost that like solidarity somewhere it's i think there's a lot of issues it's, it's sad yeah we're getting into the issues of like crypt of uh not crypto but the um social media platforms and the news organizations i mean you know this is all based off of just you know who can say the most ridiculous thing and who gets the clicks on right, it. Right. An issue with like the social media is like, if you start clicking on something, it attracts what you like. So, you know, you click one thing that says, uh, I don't Becomes know, your world, maybe man. it's a meme. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's a meme that Bush did nine 11 or something. And uh, great. Now yeah. My podcast is going to get canceled because I said that, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> I you know, set you up, like, bro. I'm, yeah, I'm working you set with Joe up. Rogan, by the way. <laughs> Joe is like, dude, whatever you can do, just like crush this guy. I'm concerned about him. My execs are concerned about him. Like, Joe can already just, see in the future. Just mention, yeah, just <laughs> mention 9-11. Mention, you know, public up <laughs> evil, and, and we're good. We'll, we'll, be and we'll, we'll be good. I got, I'll stay on top. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but to get back to the point it's like you click one of those things it's a joke and instagram's like oh he's in and they'll just start spamming yeah. you with just a little bit more down the rabbit hole you know let's keep pushing him a little right. bit more down the rabbit hole and you build this repetitive nature if you're always seeing it and it's just going to keep pushing you down that rabbit hole and you start to think okay well everybody on my side of the spectrum believes that and everybody on the other side of the spectrum believes that and it's like that's not the case in reality. Number one, whenever we're on a keyboard, we're going to say more emotional shit. And you can't tell if like the value that they're transmitting because it's only text versus talking and the emotion in your voice and body language, it all plays into the picture. So if it's just text, you get to interpret that how you want. So you have a proclivity to interpret it 
how you have always interpreted it, that kind of stuff. And when it pushes you down that rabbit hole, that's what's creating that divide that pushes us more towards one side or the other. And dude, I mean, I was talking to someone else about this recently. It's like, dude, if the 20th century has taught us anything about humans or about politics, it's like you go too far to the left i.e. Stalin's uh, Russia, i.e. Mao's right, right, China, right, right. millions of people die. If you go too far to the right, i.e. Hitler's Germany, millions of people die. It's like, dude, you're, it's like you're both right and you're both wrong. So let's just align in the middle because of it. And it's like, I remember... I'm an independent for that reason. Well, dude, and I'm people a true will, independent. And people will lose their minds if they hear that. Like, you, you have to be one yeah, or the yeah. other. You have to vote. Like, you're, you're wasting your vote if you don't vote for Republican or Democrat. It's like, how in the hell did we instill this idea that you're wasting your vote? It's like, no, how else are we supposed to tell the two-party system we're broken? Like, I, and maybe we're getting a little too deep into politics. I don't want to. I don't want to take it to that place. But I just want to highlight that going too far either number way. Number two pod, podcast number yeah. two. Oh, wow. <laughs> Already have, next everyone's season. gone. <laughs> I mean, we've lost everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We've lost our audience. I so think what? I have one subscriber. And now we're down to zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It might have been me. Well, I'm that was me. I'm subscribed yeah. myself. No, I, <laughs> Yeah, I, I unsubscribed. Yeah, yeah, so we had to now we're done. Yeah, dude, it, it, let's just let's leave it on the point that we go too far right, millions die. We go too far left, millions die. The answer is usually in the middle. You're both right and you're both wrong. And it's like if we can just if we can just come to an agreement on that, maybe we don't. Maybe we can't even agree on that. Which I don't know. That's maybe that's too much energy for right now. I want to I want to keep this so a little. I I I, I think. Full circle summary. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur is being <laughs> hyper aware. Yeah. Right? Right. It's it's being able to filter that information right. and, and not be distracted by it. Right. Right. Like you, you start asking me about politics, I don't fucking know. Right. I don't care. Sure. I'm not I'm not one to step into it because I, I have other things that I need to focus on, right? Same thing with ninety percent of what we discuss. It's like like it's so critical to have this skill, have have the cognitive ability to comprehend what's going on, know good from bad, and kind of sustain your lane. And that that's really what creates that core focus, right? There's there's not any one thing that you can do or one skill set you can have that can make you, you know, be that superstar. It's it's really everything. Like you, you kind of need to know everything and you just kind of narrow the field and as, right. as one of my former partners would say, know enough to be dangerous. That that was his thing. He's like, I don't need to know, you know, the nuanced points of everything. I just need to know enough so I can be dangerous. So I, I can do I what I have to well do. Said. And, because, yeah. And because... then I, I, had a, I had a neighbor growing up, which is, it, this is a two-sided equation. It's like, know enough to be dangerous. That's your education. That's your intelligence, right? The other side of the equation is the focus element. And he worked for, I don't know, like some, like a uh, payroll company um, in like the seventies or some shit, like crazy times back then. I kind of wish I was around, but uh, fortunately I'm not. I'm here today. Mm -hmm. So be Gotta it. Gotta live this life. His, Stay yeah, present, his bro. Sales, Stay present. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. His sales manager actually would tell him like, like you just need to be a, a, a cattle in the field, like grazing, right? Just be a cattle in the, or a cow in the field grazing. Like, you know, the, the customer is the grass and you just want to keep eating and, and getting as much as you can, as much business as you can. And he said, if you look at cattle in a field, their tails are always kind of like whipping, right? Okay. And the reason their tails whip is because that's the way they knock flies off of them because flies are constantly, you know, coming as, as kind of these distraction uh, points. And, the cow just continues focus, you know, doing what it needs to do. And his tail just kind of swats it away, all the distractions, but stays focused. And it's it's almost, well, it is, it's completely natural, right? right? So you, you have, you know, the intelligence side of things, and then you have the focus side of things. So you don't have to be it. dangerous, and, and you're a cow just grazing in the field, staying laser focused on what you need to do. And, you know, you just naturally hit away any distraction that comes your way and you, you marry those two concepts and it's like 
you're off to a pretty good start, man. Dude, I love talking with you, but something's telling me we got to end it on on that note. We're all just just As we should. grazing in the field. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. have you on though again because I don't don't be a pig. Pig don't. pigs get slaughtered. Pigs get... be a cow. All right, Mister Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, be a pig, yeah. be a cow. Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay, cool, dude. But, dude, I fucking greatly appreciate your time, man. Um, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm definitely going to have you on again at some point. Once, uh, you know, I got to get a couple more people in here, you know, and then we'll bring you back yeah, on for sure. We need, to, we need to grow yeah. some businesses. You know, I, I, I want it to be as esoteric as possible. It's like, you know, we can have a conversation that stays on track and it's like, okay, like everyone's done that. Like, let's, let's get a little esoteric here and, and kind of what if, right? Like right. the anxiety thing we spoke about. What if? It's a whole bunch of what ifs. So, right. Yeah, man, it was uh, a pleasure being on uh, for episode one. Um, you know, if we don't chat between now and your departure, um, Godspeed, man, have a safe flight. Um, we'll definitely have to uh, catch up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, We'd love to hear more about what the big plan is and oh, yeah, uh, how I can support it any way possible. So just keep in your thoughts, man. I mean, just and this for you and everyone listening, just like, follow, subscribe, share this. I mean, you know, anyone you think might be a like minded individual, get this out to them. Maybe maybe they'll come on at some point. I mean, that's how we spread this knowledge. If something again, if something we said resonates with you, take it and run with it. If something we said pisses you off to no end. I mean, figure out why, like, honestly, like in my life, if someone says something and I'm like, that's so fucking wrong. My first thought is like, okay, well, why do I think that's wrong? And I've had so much growth from that. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, dude, again, a huge pleasure. Thank you for your time. I know how valuable it is. Um, you right know, on. I appreciate you and you know, I'll end it on, uh, let's all grow together. So thanks again, Kev.